Hi there. Thank you for downloading and listening to and watching the Lean Into Art Cast. This is a show where a couple of visual storytellers get together and take on various topics that tend to cross one's path when you go on this adventure of communicating with images. We think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Drozd. I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is... Well, I'm Rob Stensger. I make video games, I do UX design, and I coach folks about these things too. Good to see you again, Rob. Good to see you, Jersey. Uh, my gosh. My gosh. What's my gosh? Yeah. My gosh. Well, I mean, it's, uh, it's, we have a fun topic prepared. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. It's, it's, um, I don't, service minded marketing, right? And it's kind of, I just have a lot of, a lot of thoughts and feelings, a lot of experiments. I feel like have been experimenting with this and it's just, uh, I'm really curious uh, and looking forward to exploring uh, what's on your mind about this too. Yeah. Um, because. You know, I just keep on trying to get better at it. Oh, getting a little bit of more lagging going on with the zoom call. That's always fun. Um, rats. Yeah. And and now it's telling me that my internet connection is unstable. So I think this might be on my end. Um, Mm. anyway, uh, moving, proceeding on, uh, we'll do our best with this. Yes. This idea of service might, Hey, looking at (laughs) playing around. (laughs) (laughs) So this All is a topic- sudden, yeah, guitar- instead of me, it's uh, my video game guitar fretter popped up as uh, my cam- my my webcam, and and, uh, and there's a demonstration of service minded a distracting moment. Service minded marketing in the sense that Rob was trying to see if his camera was working and then using it as an opportunity to let us all know about a product that he makes called Guitar Fretter. <laughs> it's meant to be subtle product placement, like uh, <laughs> ah, a refreshing. <laughs> A refreshing, relaxing session of guitar fretter. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm also available and engaged uh, in podcasting as well. Look at this. Anyway, <laughs> just all placement. So, but so yeah, service We're already minded. in it. We're already in it, you know, in the topic. And for those who are new to the show, we usually pick a single topic and try to like spend an hour drilling down as far as we can on it, both in the terms of like what the, pro- the, the topic looks like when we're engaged with it. And then you know, how we think about it. And then we close with this thing called the two minute practice where we challenge ourselves and everybody else to take on like a little bit of practice in their lives, uh, two minutes at a go. Um, But this week's topic, yes, is it's a topic that I think we touch on a lot in this series. And I know we've done some full episodes on it, but it's been a while since we've given an hour to just focus on what do we mean by service minded marketing, showing up in the spirit of service. This is something that I have you said in like panel discussions and in appearances whenever I do professional development for, you know, using comics in the classroom, uh, professional development workshops for cartoonists. As I say, like, you know, it seems to me that almost every opportunity I've ever had as a professional cartoonist came out of me showing up and, and in the spirit of not saying it out loud necessarily, but showing up with this attitude of how can I help? And then examining listening, figure out how I can help. And then when the opportunity to help arises, I say, hey, I might be able to help with that. And here's specifically how. Um, the Ann Arbor Comic Arts Festival, which is, you know, for the last 11 years, I've served as a programming coordinator. That project began because I met Dan Mishkin in 2006 and he expressed an idea. I listened, I thought, I came back and I, I, I visited, Dan, Dan and I weren't friends yet. And I went to a lot of events where Dan was and we continued the conversation and I was sort of like trying to feel my way around. Like, what, what do you mean when you're asking about this, this comics festival for kids? And then it wasn't until 2009 that we actually launched the first year of doing it. Right. And it wasn't until I figured out, okay, here's the specific way I think I can help. And then we were able to make it happen. So that's the, that's the, a, a short anecdote to like generally describe this idea. I know we're going to mm-hmm. get thick into it. So let me hit the music and then we'll, we'll get there. Uh, what am I going to play? What am I going to play? What am I going to play? <laughs> what? This isn't the song. <laughs> Sometimes you have to defy expectations. <laughs> good. Good to keep this all on our toes. <laughs> all right. The music yeah. indicates that we're now into the topic. So I want to hear from you, Rob. I want to hear you. I, I did a lot of like front loading of this thing. So what do you think about when you think about the terms? service-minded marketing 
let's see. It's um, it's not a, a, like a, it's not an easy thing. Depending on how you frame up, uh, like doing your thing, like like applying your craft, making a trade, it, and uh, it. I mean, if if you have a a bias toward the sort of like you're on your own path, you're making your career, you're making your opportunities, you're going to have a more of a an interest and in practice that's along these lines of saying that, well, whenever I show up somewhere, I, uh, you know, I'm looking for opportunities. To, like, where can I help? How can I help? And because, because just running in and, and yelling, how can I help? It's not really helpful. Um, <laughs> well, there's this, it's, uh, there's this idea in crisis situations where somebody says, somebody call 911. And I remember I took like a emergency response training thing when ages ago for one of my day jobs that I had. And they said like, never say somebody called 911, point to a person and say, you call 911, right? Ah, that's, yeah. Because, yeah, uh, if I know there's, you know, Lean Into Art's been around for almost a decade. And uh, I'm going to, I know like we share a lot of, a, a lot of biases that we have, um, have had in the beginning. We, we carry with us to, you know, today where um, I think in today's perspective and language, there's, um, you know, we're trying to, you know, decolonize. We're trying to um, be aware of the, the effects of living in a constant system of commerce and stuff like that. But if you set all that, that aside and you still care about making stuff and you still you know, like just because it's just your vocabulary of how you interact with the world. I love to make stuff. I love to under and to, to be like, I want to have this like a positive effect on them. Right. And, uh, but at the same time, like I won't be chosen to be someone that can help in the ways I want to help, like making video games or doing UX design or facilitating or teaching or whatever, any of those, those things, or even someone being aware that I make games too. And, um, you know, whether it's a product that I offer or a service that I offer, uh, how does, how does that recognition happen? And so that's what marketing's for is, is spreading the awareness of the thing you do and you know, hopefully reaching the the people that that uh, that want what you do, and then recognize now. Oh, okay, you do that thing. I'm I'm aware now that I, the the marketing message has has come across. Uh, so you, yeah. So even if you have this potential, have this interest, um. Well, how do you you know how do you how do you cross that threshold of not from not knowing to knowing and and uh, and make that connection? So. Um, I, I thought, uh, that this, that this phrase, um, if you're, if you're looking for situations for marketing, uh, what you do, uh, right to be helpful where you're at, right. In this context, in this room, in this event, or in this tabling situation with this particular person, that's working, uh, and I think that's going into it with the spirit of service. Uh, because you, you're you're looking to not just impose or um, push the thing. You're trying to have it be met and and understood and and sort of communicated, right? I don't know. There's yeah, the, yeah. Because you if you don't come from that that background of wanting to, um, you know show up independently like you're if you're hired for a role and you can focus on a specific thing on a, in a team contributing to a thing where it's, i don't think you have to think about that that often right mm -hmm. that's true that's well i mean like there's yes there's like a whole like in in other like more traditional kind of job placements there's like an interview process to determine who's the right person for the job and there's like a certain kind of like uh, a, a dialogue that happens between hire and hiree to like find out wh where the fit is, but like it's more ambiguous in a situation where you're at an event or you're in a gathering of any kind, any kind of group gathering, right? Like joining, like say, like a small drink and uh, draw club kind of thing, feeling out like what's the dynamic here, right? Like the a a good um <clears throat> a good uh, dichotomy that I think of about this is. I've been at events where an artist has come up to me 
and I've never met them before. And they, I, you could tell within three seconds that their intent is to forge some kind of trade, like some kind of a, uh, this conversation, everything hinges on this conversation to form some kind of trade between us, whether it's me hiring them or us working together or me promoting them and some other platform, whatever. But like that, you could, that intensity is there. And then there's people hmm. who like sort of weave in and out of my life. And like Jeremy Burley with the Art and Story podcast was the example I always pointed to. And I said like in, his nickname was Art and Story or number one because he just continuously checked in on the show and commented and responded. And he always showed up and provided like helpful, thoughtful reactions to what we were doing. And then one day he like, we did an episode where I think, I, I forget the exact situation, but we answered it with a question like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how, how I feel about this or how to think about this. And Jeremy offered like a really, really interesting perspective. And I was like, this person continuously just shows up and responds thoughtfully to what we are expressing needs for. And so it's, it's time to get this person integrated into the project. You know, like, so we, Jeremy took on a more active role in like being a guest on the show and, and interacting more in the Art and Story Forum. This is a story we've told a bunch of times. Lead into Art is an outgrowth of you showing up to the Lead into Art forums with helpful information. You know, like we had a, we had like a kind of a clunky system. It was like a pre-Patreon Patreon that we had there. And there was a clunky system for like consuming the behind the scenes uh, premium content. And Rob figured out a way to make it easier for people who are supporting us to actually enjoy the content we were making, you know? And so I was like, there's another signal. This person shows up. They're paying attention to what we're doing. They're seeing what the pain points are and they're offering assistance. Rob didn't just walk into the forum and go like, hey guys, how can I help? Mm. Here to help, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's um that's a that's an interesting thing. So it, it's like it's it, it's not to just critique people harshly, because if you don't know where to begin, that's OK. Yeah. Right. But we're recognizing like someone who wants to help and is just yelling their want isn't what we mean by service minded. Right. So right. like you're 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 knowing who you're trying to help enough to bring that desire to help in up in a useful contextual way. And um, that's, yeah, there's a, there's a difference, but, it, and it's okay to not be skilled at that um, and to try to, to, to build yourself up and, and to get, get better at, you know, the, 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 the timing and the context of, of just saying I could do this or just demonstrating that you can do this and then you can be recognized for doing that. And, uh, you know, continue to, to build a relationship. But there's a thing you described earlier that, that um, I think is really important and functional for a lot of businesses, but doesn't apply in all contexts, is that uh, the idea of closing a deal. Yeah. And you want to cause a transaction, maybe it's a complicated transaction to become aware and to choose to hire a person and then to, you know, start running the gauntlet of, of writing up a contract and all this stuff. But like the, uh, you know, there's a lot of businesses that operate, uh, you know, individuals and, you know, large orgs that they're landing deals all the time. And it that's okay, good. That's a functional way to, to operate, but it doesn't apply always. So if you're, if you're just showing up and it's like, Hey Jersey, let's make a deal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, and that's maybe. just it. See what you're pointing to too, is that there's, there's a fundamental communication, com communication mismatch there in that, I don't doubt the sincerity of somebody who shows up and says, I'm here to help. How can I help? I'm not questioning that. Like if, you, if you're doing that, you've already done part of the work because you're showing up and you're committing. But now there's another part of it where what's in your head and what's in my head haven't met. And, you know, me expressing my needs and you finding out where you can help fill those needs and, and solve the problems that like I'm encountering as an org, as an event, as a group, Right. That, that communication hasn't happened, right? So like there's like there's some investigation and, and dialogue that needs to happen in, in situations that we're like we're exploring here, like you said, like not this is different than in the situation where it's like I'm going on Shark Tank to make a pitch for my new product or I'm going to a publisher with a pitch for a new book, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking about you are interacting with a large organization, event, group, whatever, um, and you want to be you want your work to be noticed and appreciated for what it can do do you show up to well what kind of wait well i guess now would be a good time to like very briefly explore like what does that look like what are some specific mm -hmm. things you can do at events and with organizations to show up in the spirit of service so that they will notice what you can bring to the room and then hopefully notice the other things that you make 
Uh, well, you can curate ahead of time. So you can look for events that really sort of match your ethos and the kinds of services you want to bring into the world, right? We may have some network issues going on right now. Is there, am I getting laggy on your end? Yeah. Okay. This is the fun business of doing a live show. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, your audio is decent, but the video is very uh, stuttery. Mm. That's, that's, mm. that, yeah, that's where it was with you earlier. Um, mm. Yeah, this could be Zoom or it could be a lot of things from any any point in between. <laughs> yeah, we we have we have a lot so, of yeah. Go ahead, Rob. Well, I don't know. Like uh should we let's see. Audio's working. So mm -hmm. should we uh you were describing how uh we you know we could we could point out specific uh, examples of like you know, opportunities to, to do some service minded marketing. And, and so it could be connecting with, a, with events in a variety of different way, ways, anything from tabling to consulting, or maybe you're speaking at event and an, at an event or, um, uh, yeah, I guess uh, focusing on, on all kinds of things that, that relate there. Um, you could do some curating up front and I mean, look for events that are asking like, or, or put a call to action that is really well met with your beliefs and your like your your mission for your business right mm -hmm. uh the kind of work that you want to create uh look for look for common ground and, and start with those kind of organizations and um and so because that's always an easy place to go is like well people who um tend like a lot of folks who want <laughs> Announce publicly, yeah, we have a call for um, proposed talks. And going, by the way. Not good, I don't think. Mm. Well, dare I do something dangerous and try to switch which, uh, which node of my network I'm on? I don't know. Um, we can see what will happen. I don't think we have anything to lose. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see if I switch to my five gigahertz network. Connect. We'll see if I if I get if I get lost. All right, I am on the five gigahertz network. See if there's any improvement there on the latency and in the streaming. Hmm. Is it better like this, or is it better like this? It better like this. I think it's it's now getting better, improving. But Good. Um, so yeah, for some, yeah, for some reason my Windows right. machine kicked me over to the the the, the main um, network, the rather the main thing on the router, the main channel instead of my five gigahertz channel. I don't know why I did hmm. that, and I really need to get an Ethernet cable that can reach over to the thing so I could be hardwired from now on. So this might be on me. Tough to say. Um, a lot of things can inter interfere with, um, I mean, it depends on, yeah, it depends on which frequency you're connected and it's, it, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but so if radio it's, signals, what are you going to do? Yeah. So to, to build on that point, like another thing that you're pointing to, Rob, when you talk about like finding events and groups that match your principles or your vision or your, um, approach to things that's that's where if you don't have words for it it'd be time to sit down and think about like what what are what does success look like to you what is what are you trying to accomplish with your work what's the what are the principles behind the work that you're doing and can you name specifically like what look at, again success criteria like what do you want to have happen we're not just talking about trade as in money changing hands this could be trade as in um being noticed and uh, more deeply integrated into a group or organization that you have a lot of affection for or believe in, right? Mm -hmm. So it could, it could be something where it's like, I, I want to volunteer and be more involved at a deeper level. Well, how do you get noticed? Well, showing up in the spirit of service that to make it, the, the thing that I, I say a lot to, to like my students when I'm mentoring them into like college and like trying to find careers, I'm like, um, there's a way to be indispensable. 
and that's to show up and do good work over and over again. <laughs> You know, it's like, it's like being like overprotective of, of like your area of expertise and trying to fend off quote unquote competitors. Yeah. I suppose that's a way of doing it. But like, if you just like do like really excellent work and always show up and are really principled and thoughtful and and committed, um, people are going to want to be around that all the time. Um, even if they don't know the words for it, they'll, they'll feel they'll, it gives off something. It gives off a, a presence that like, this is a person that we can rely on over and over again, you know? So, and there is there's a way to do this too, where obviously you you think about your you know okay you're you, maybe you're on board with okay that's a good filter uh, think of my mission think of their mission and you know who do I where do I what communities do I want to be a part of, uh, but then uh, well how do you operate what can you afford to do is important to think about as well um, because this is talking about not just doing free things but also paid things right mm-hmm. so you go to um, Maybe you want to do, um, you know, work your way into paid speaking engagements and, um, but you're willing to get your name out there and practice, test your material, right? And do some product development in, in places where there aren't, um, you know, there, you know, if some events are more volunteer based and, you know, there's the revenue is, is not as much a, um, you know, like a, like people paying for tickets at the door and then some kind of, um, you know, people you're being paid to provide essentially engaging some content for, for the, and experiences at the venue. Um, the it's, you know, it, it varies, but, uh, but you can, you can decide what you can afford to do and, and, um, you know, for the, for, for events that you believe in and the communities that you want to reach, give, you know, uh, give your, give yourself some amount of time and effort budget where you're, you're willing to, um, to, to sort of develop, develop your, that other message and stuff. And we're implying a lot of this, that, that, um, no matter what you do as a creator, you're also a teacher. That doesn't have to be the case. Just, right. you know, it just, there's a natural, um, a really natural fit there. It's one really strong case for service minded marketing. Mm-hmm. but it doesn't have to be that uh, right because right. maybe there's a very specific slice of the kind of thing that you do maybe you juggle and you're an author maybe um you know you play banjo and you're um an illustrator okay you don't have to teach that it just could be that's your thing to sort of connect and provide something that that uh that's that's additional benefit to, to that to that group that also can be a separate product and service. Absolutely. Yeah. And Anne was actually at a museum conference recently held, of course, over Zoom. And one of the breakout sessions after like a lot of like, you know, deep digging and hard thinking about solving problems in their community and in their in their in their industry, um, they had some museum people who were also musicians put together a live performance over Zoom, right? And it was just like it was just like a a, a break in the day to like have some music performed by people who are also, you know, experts in the museum field. So, um, it doesn't have to be something as, as, um, directly measurable as teaching. It can be performance. It could be other things like what else do you, and and the thing that I, like I always ask is what's in it for the audience? Well, this is a break in the day. It's a chance to have some music and relax and be a little bit like, you know, not quite so in, intently focused for a little while. That's a service, right? Uh, now, I want to, I, I really, before we move on to our break, I really want to talk about this idea of like advertising because like, how does advertising, like making an ad for yourself, how can that be service minded? I know you've been thinking hard about this a lot. Well, I, I think we can... Uh... <laughs> what you make is it's not like we're saying, Hey, whatever you do, whatever you create, that's not enough. Do more. It's there's, there's, there's a service in the, the products and stuff that you put into the world. You're making stories or illustration or interactive experience or what have you. Um, That is a valuable thing in and of itself, but then how do become people become aware of it? Spreading that awareness is a service like getting that, um, uh, getting your products in the hands of the people that want and need them is helpful. The, the world is a big complex place full of tons of different, um, 
things that aren't what you have to offer. So how do you get your thing, your stuff into the mix to, to get others to be aware, to then be able to connect to that thing that you make. And that's where it's like, Oh, you know, advertising it, it, that's, it, it really, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a Gen Xer and I remember, uh, it, like, I don't know, ad campaigns that, that are so it's blah. <laughs> And trying to uh, appeal to the the irony of like, well, I need you to be aware of this product, but meh. And uh, <laughs> if, did did you, um, you ever encounter OK Soda? I, you know, I didn't. And I looked it up when you put it in the notes. And I was like, oh my gosh, that is so such a Gen Xer thing to do. <laughs> Where it's like, it's like all they needed was like Winona Ryder with a clove cigarette going like, buy it or not, I guess. <laughs> yeah, doesn't matter. And... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it really, it could have been called whatever. <laughs> and uh, and it, I'm sure that, that was probably spitballed. There were probably regions of that that had a version of so that, that soda called whatever. And, and it was, um, but, it, but they did it. They're doing the work. They're wrapping it in irony and, mm. uh, and trying to appeal to, a, to an audience who, who doesn't really want to be advertised to. But even the most Gen X or, or uh, any other generation who's caught that same bug of, you know what, ads are yuck. Ads get in my way. Ads, ads are these interstitials where I'm trying to watch, um, you know, I want to watch football to the groin again. And, you know, now I've got this, you know, car ad, please. And right, uh, right. So, so now I have to practice this. I can tune out for a while and ignore a thing or whatever it's, but, Th- then think of when the ad hits you right in the f- right where you care and need and feel and it's like the right thing pops up in, and and you, you're scrolling by something on Instagram and it's like uh holy crap I want that book and or that guitar doohickey or something right mm-hmm. it's that that right message at the right time thing uh, is a service Mm-hmm. So um, it's worth thinking about advertising your, your, your work, just not the extra stuff, not the side stuff also, but like getting that awareness of your work. That's the, um, yeah, off the, off the cuff thesis about um, service minded marketing is, is, you know, part of that is getting the word out about the things. You yeah. Have. It's, it's beating them where they are too. Right. It's like, uh, that's, yeah. that's a big part of it is like the, the gen, the okay soda, the moment I like saw the label and started reading the, the Wikipedia article about, it, I'm like, Oh, totally. That, that, that's the kids watching my so-called life. And then some kind of at t ad pops up about staying connected with grandma. And they're like, whatever. And okay. Soda leans in. It's like, yeah, I know. Right. It's the worst. That's why our soda is just called. Okay. Cause it's just okay. <laughs> Cause who cares? You know? And, and yeah, it's, you could read that as being manipulative, but I mean, art is meant to manipulate. And also it's like, it's meeting them where they're at and saying, okay, we have a thing for you and we're bringing the message to, to where you are right now. And this is, this is another way of saying what's in it for the audience, All right? This is the thing that I keep mm-hmm. coming back to again and again is uh, a me- one of my success criteria for anything that I do is, is like, can I, can I name specifically what the audience gets out of this or what? I hope they'll get out of this, right? Like what the intent for value is and ba- in the, how do I establish that? It's based on the criteria of like, well, finding out who my audience is, who I'm trying to serve and what kind of needs that they have in their life. Right. Um, yeah. That's, that's important. Ex- that's just really important as an exercise because the like caught on your heels. A lot of us don't necessarily have that language at the ready. So, mm-hmm. It's, it is an extra hat to wear. It's an extra job to say, okay, I need to put language f- about this thing that connects it to those people in a more meaningful way. How does it benefit them? It's not just, wow, this was hard to make. And I keep thinking about all the work I had on this two page spread and what have you. It's like, well, yeah, okay. Your craft matters and the hard work you put into it matters, but that may not be the language that really hits the audience in a way that clarifies why this is important and will help them. Um, that's a very good, that is a great distinction, right? And it's not to say that the craft isn't interesting to some people. It depends on who you're trying to serve. If I want to reach like hardcore, you know, practitioners who really want to level up and like really 
get you know juiced about all the minutia of the craft. There you go. That was what the Art and Story podcast was designed to be from the start. It's like these are the conversations between artists about like the heavy duty lifting they do in their craft, and like in a way that's not. It was explicitly not meant for broad consumption, right? We said it from the start. This isn't for people who just like to read comics. This is for people who really like to dig deep and make comics. Um, but what what are you trying to? Who are you trying to market to? What group are you trying to integrate with? What are their uh, apparent missions? And hopefully, if it's if it's a large organization, they actually put a vision and mission statement someplace on their website, so you can at least get that much research done, right? And if you can bring it to the level of of your what your description isn't just talking at them, you're talking to try to under, to to in a way that shows you understand the need that that uh, demonstrates the common ground and why your product is is well met there. And that's why like, okay, soda is a, is a silly, but interesting example because it's, it's on the surface. Uh, it's a little crass, but it's, but it's actually really speaking to something that, that um, is very clarifying of like, well, this advertising that is necessary. And we know that, you know, we could, we, that are, it's typically our job to overpromise and get you attached to this aspirational thing, but we get it. It's just, a, it's a soda. It's fine. Just, you know, um, well, and, but, and, and which it, is, it, yeah, it, it points to what is, uh, historically been a very heavy, heavy handed sort of trying to appeal to big feelings in people. Right. It, it's like, it's moving exactly the other way. Right. It's like, again, I think of all those long distance commercials from when we were kids and it was always about like bringing family together. And like, everybody has the joke about crying during a long distance commercial. Right. And so it's like, well, that feels schmaltzy. That feels trite. It feels constructed and insincere. And okay. So it comes in and says like, yup, it is. So <laughs> we know. We know. Ah, what can you do? <laughs> what can you do? Right? Yeah. So like we're not gonna we're not gonna talk to you like that, you know? So, so that yeah, I, I think it's a it's a perfect example of not not to just like again, not just do what they did, but like the meta of what they did, which was to say like what what are these people experiencing? And Yeah. That what's that common, you know, uh that belief that we know that we could if, if we describe this product well it's like this is what we're talking about yes on the surface it's another book and to put on your shelf i know but this book is uh it's it's addressing the problems of let's see uh let's pick a book to what's what's a book that stands out uh let's i guess well, it's just it's addressing the problems of of uh building trust and belonging when you don't feel like you, you, um, you belong and you've had a hard time, you know, making friends and all that. Okay. Concise. And it's not talking about how hard it was to draw and, and, or how many pages it has. And, you know, it's like the benefits, not just the features. Mm -hmm. So, yep. That's great. All right. You want to take a break and talk a little bit more about I this? I do. Okay. All right. We'll come back in a minute and a half. And what are we going to talk about? Uh, Service-minded marketing when you're stuck, busy, or figuring it out, or figuring out if it's a fit for your work. Oh my gosh, yeah. So now, now you're hitting on like a major tension. This idea of like, well, how do I, yeah, I can level up at this over time. Over time. And I don't have time. Time is that thing that I don't have. So how do I do this too, right? Um, mm. Also pointing to like how it, it is kind of sometimes a very long game. Like I would say A2 calf constantly evolved as we got more information from the people who interacted with it right and 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 found the mismatches over the years there were many times where we we're like well that wasn't a good fit why wasn't it a good fit think about it anyway talk about mm -hmm. that but first we got to thank some people who make this show possible and those people are the folks who support us on patreon Yes, patreon.com slash lean into art is the website. What is it? It's a way for you to give us a monthly upvote. If, if you believe in what we do here and you get value out of it, uh, you can make it more sustainable by contributing as little as a dollar a month. You can also do a one time contribution and then just like avail yourself of the behind the scenes stuff and then, you know, check out at the end of the month. Come back whenever you have, you know, the discretionary cash to throw into it. But I want to thank five people who have been contributing on an ongoing basis. Shawnee Redfern, thank you, Shawnee, for believing in us and what we do. You can find Shawnee on Twitter at Shawnee Redfern. And still with us, the Metal Witch Sketchbook Project. Thank you so much for supporting us. And Chris Watkins, thank you, Chris. It means a lot. JS Taskus, 
Thank you, JS, for you know being here month after month. And Nate Marcel. Thank you, Nate, for believing in us and what we do. You can find Nate on Twitter at Great Sea Monster. You can join them all at patreon.com slash Lena to Art, where you will find all the shows we make, as well as the extra leans, the shows we record only for people who support us on Patreon. Those posts become an open mic thread where you can talk about whatever you want in a safe space with fellow leaners. It also gets you access to the Lena to Art Discord, the Patreon only channels where you can po- you know, post things to get it- feedback from the bl- brain trust and also a social channel. Patreon com slash Lena Tart is the website. Thanks to everybody who supports us there. It means a lot. It really does. Thank you very much. All right. Now, how about we get to the second half? Maybe. There we go. <laughs> Saved it for the second half. Bring so the can, energy. So we can end strong. Yeah. Had a few hiccups early on in this episode. So <laughs> are we, it, am I stuttering or am I dancer, dancing? It's, it, uh, it, it could be bandwidth or it could be the moves. Oh, it was, it's, it's definitely speed racer animation right now. <laughs> <laughs> arms up, arms down, arms up, arms down. <laughs> Fair uh, enough. I, uh, I don't know. I, uh, I, I, I don't know if I would be as brave as that monkey and that little boy hiding in the trunk of the Mach five. Uh, it, well, it, it, I mean, as a total aside, I, I recently had the pleasure of being referred to as pops by a younger person. And uh, it, 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 while the, the stung stung at first, then the, my next thought was, well, wait a minute, pops racer is pretty awesome. <laughs> I'll own that. <laughs> <laughs> How funny. What an interesting <laughs> slang that that uh, that remains. I, I don't know, like to be noted as pops i suppose it's saying hey you know you're well, you're, yeah. you're uh, in, in a further age range than i'm at so and you you seem avuncular and friendly <laughs> no nah. pops hey pops <laughs> nice all right uh so yeah what about like the leveling up part and the finding the time part uh i think is an interesting place to dig a little bit so like mm. what, what, what where do you want to start on this rob well, let's see. So we mentioned in the in the first half that it's not um yeah, this isn't something that we're we're necessarily, you know, instantly ready to do as soon as we think of it. It's because so you can notice that um okay, this service minded thing, I kind of get it. I'm kind of sold, but then I want to act on it and just okay, so I'm I'm I yeah, of course I want people to be more aware of what I'm making and especially this this group, this community, what have you. Uh, and then, but now what I I'm sold, I think it's a good idea, but what, how can I start to dabble and, um, and sort of, you know, like figure out what's a good fit for me and my projects. And I think really like taking a look at, um, well, stuff you're ready. What are your strengths? What do you feel like sharing? I think that that's where, um, being a teaching artist is a really strong case because chances are to build your build your thing to make your game to do your illustrations or posters or stories or comics or anything it's it's a path that that you needed to invest in yourself a lot to get to be able to you know put that thing into the world that path is something that can help others and whether it's it's you know the to whatever level of formality um it's uh, the, the service-minded marketing can be uh, participating in a forum for people in, in, the, in a similar situation. It could be um, reaching out to um, you know, fellow creators who are looking for help along that path or people who um, read and play, or play games and are excited about the possibility of making them, but maybe haven't dabbled yet. But... Um, and, and if you're willing to sort of share something about that, uh, that's where you can you can explore. So the mm-hmm. so the, you think about the uh, your openness to to that as a resource. You know th- that opens up the possibility of well, you could make uh, very you could do micro talks and share more about you know share the, your story or share one specific thing you learned, or if you like that that experience of of seeing others gain that skill 
well, you could do a small workshop and, and, uh, uh, and, and maybe control a lot of variables. So you don't have to do a lot of improvising on the spot. Um, and then all the way up to, well, you could do a longer workshop that of varying complexity that you could welcome people in at any time when you're, cause, because when you're at a venue performing this kind of thing as a teaching artist, uh, it's not like it's a school with bells that ring and people are meant to be walking at one point and then not. And then in their seats at another point, uh, people are just doing stuff. And so they can show up and uh, you're, you're, prob- you're gaining a lot of skill and comfort as a teaching artist when you're able to just meet everyone where they're at any time d- during that, that session you're providing, that kind of thing. Um, but you don't have to start there. You can start um, uh, with, with uh, start simpler and smaller. And, and, and if that is appealing to you, to, so, so I just, you know, so what do you think is, what are your thoughts about the, 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 the teaching artist path? In this? Well, you, you've, I think you've outlined very nicely sort of like the different approaches you can take depending on what your, your comfort level and your experience level is. And even if you haven't done a whole lot of it, um, you're reminding me about a video that exists on YouTube, uh, of a, of a webinar that I did and let me pull it up on screen. Um, I think it's right here. There we go. Um, Documenting Your Classroom Experience, which I recorded for the Ohio Arts Council uh, earlier this year. And it's, uh, well, it's an hour long video. It says right there on the screen. Um, And what it is, is it's literally me spending the first half saying like, okay, when you're doing interactions with people, uh, like whether it's a workshop or demonstration, things are happening. How do you notice those things and how do you capture those things so that you can package it up into something that is transmissible to a potential new partner, right? So it, it's it's largely like about like how to make a lesson plan, even if you've never made a lesson plan, but you've done a little bit mm. of presenting. But it's also the express purpose of it was to help teaching artists. That's why they hired me. They hired me because they, they get a lot of proposals from teaching artists where it's not very clear what they can do. Like they're, they're not finding the language to describe what's going to happen in the room because this is part of the, the value exchange is that you show up and say, okay, you're going to pay me to come to your place and this is going to happen. These things are going to happen. Well, how do, you, how do you describe that? Well, you can document and capture and journal from the experiences you have had to put together a picture of what could happen, right? So we'll link to this in the show notes. Um, I worked hard on that presentation. I think it was pretty good. Um, but it's... It, I, Anne and I were literally just talking about this yesterday, about in 2001, when I was living in Phoenix, Arizona, and Anne was working at the Phoenix Public Library, and they said, hey, your husband makes comics, doesn't he? Would he, would he be willing to come in and do a workshop? And Anne came home and asked me, and I was, I was almost shouting angry. I was like, what are you talking about? I have no business working with people. You know, I'm not famous. I'm nobody. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear from me. And what's more is I don't know the first thing about teaching people how what I do. I know how to do it, but get but putting that in front of people and making it something they can actually do something with? No. Flat no. She's like, but they're gonna pay you. I'm like, no, get out of my why would you bring this to me? How dare you? You know, it's like I was like that angry that I was asked to actually show up and teach. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. That's like that's almost like a, uh like a like a like a, a a trope that you're like you 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 have the this is like a um like a comic season setup where you go from this yeah. grumpy no no thank you artist to like kick butt teacher at you yeah. know at least you know at least you know by the end of i don't know season two but maybe even season one who knows but yeah. it's quite a setup yeah it, it is funny to think to about go from that to where you land it huh well, and, and Anne was bringing it to my attention because I was like expressing this idea of like, it's, it's so frustrating sometimes when I'm trying to make uh, other organizations or other groups understand what I see as being valuable in a teaching experience. And like, I've got all of this experience and all of these thoughts about how to make an enriching experience for, for an audience. And she's like, well, it wasn't obvious to you when you started out. As a matter of fact, you, you like were outright resentful toward the idea of doing it. Remember, my dear. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. I mean, and I think Isn't that's that a, funny that's an important thing to to understand as well is that and I, and I was just talking about this with my teen class the expertise that you have and the experiences that you have are understandably and naturally invisible to somebody who hasn't been along for the ride with you and so 
you have to find language to make that experience visible to them, right? To show up at an event, even if you see where the connections are between what you're doing and what they're doing or what that group or what that organization is doing, they don't see you. You have to come and meet them where they are and point to where what you're doing is fitting in with that. So, and, and also, there's like this term, this this concept in teaching called risk diminishment. Like, what is risk diminishment? When the, when the when the students show up, and you're there to teach, they don't know how to do the stuff the, the way that you do it, or even as deeply or as thoughtfully as skillfully as you can do it. And so, you often what I do in my classrooms, a lot of teachers do this, is you build like little activities to get started to like make them feel comfortable with this is something you can do. You can be successful at this. We're going to work with shapes. We're going to draw some random shapes, turn them into things. Wow. Look, you can interpret that shapes have meaning. Let's take it to the next level, right? Video games do this. When you start a video game, the game is often invisibly teaching you how to actually do the game, right? Mm. Yeah. I mean, if you think about um, trying to provide a rewarding experience where uh, whatever the actions are of those who are meeting what you're what you're making and providing they have a chance to because of their actions discover more about it and how do they how do they relate to it and do they care right so mm -hmm. the classic in video games it's often pointed out as uh, super mario brothers where you 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 you're sitting there with the controller in your hand and you you know you start the game and mario doesn't go left mario goes right okay so i can move to the right and oops i run into a goomba mm -hmm looks like that hurt Mario. I got to start over. Okay. So now I need to avoid the Goomba. What does this button do? This button jumps. Okay. And then, and so all these little pieces, as far as interacting and exploring, you can, that's, I, yeah, there's a whole feedback loop in my career that I love about, you know, these different things that help, uh, help with communication in interesting ways. The, the, the teaching and video games and design and all that stuff it's in storytelling. It's, it's, it's pretty neat. And um, I found that rewarding, but um, so as, as far as, well, so the, the, the teaching artist path, you don't have to start out jumping in the deep end. You, you can go really, you can go pretty informal and, uh, and build your skills and comfort. And it is a pretty strong path because think about if you, you go that route and now you don't have to just show up at a venue and, and say that it's only about transactions, right? right? You can, you can do other things and it's in a really obvious service minded way. Um, yeah, because, the, yeah. It, th this is this is like ages ago. I did a, a workshop on like how podcasting helped my comics career, and part of it is is that I showed up continuously doing this thing where I was making my attitude, outlook, and personality very available. Well, at least a public version of those things very available to the public. And and the argument I make for like doing interactive events at like festivals or any kind of trade show is that you're giving people a piece of a broader picture of what informs the work that you want them to engage with anyway, right? And so, like, you're going to have, after you, if you have a really compelling and fun experience with this person, they're like, okay, I'm going back to my table now. Thanks, bye. They're going to come back to the table with follow-up questions and curiosity about the other things that you, other services you offer, i.e. the books or things that you make. So... Um, and, and going back to this risk diminishment idea, something that we developed with a two calf, um, which I'm, I'm very proud of because I think it's very well thought through is we have quick draws. What's a quick draw? It's an opportunity for an artist to get in front of a crowd and just display the magic trick of drawing and let the audience interact only in terms of offering ideas. Right? So who is this helping? And this is the, this is the thing that like I, I get really excited about. It's helping the artist who may not have the confidence level to do a workshop yet but they want to do something that's performative and service-driven. Well, I draw all the time, after all. I'm a cartoonist. And drawing on a giant flip chart uh, on an easel, you're not going to get a masterpiece. You're going to get something that's representative. It's like Pictionary. Like the, I, the object of Pictionary isn't to do perfect representation, but to deliver concepts, right? And then, mm. so it helps them level up at performance. It helps the audience who is like, well, I'm at this thing. I'm really excited about all the comic stuff happening, and I want to interact with it but I can't even draw a stick figure. I can't draw a straight line with a ruler. You hear that a hundred times, right? Um, okay, nobody's asking you to draw, but you can still participate in the act of creativity by offering ideas to this artist who will then make your ideas happen on the paper. And this is something I tell the artists when we're working on the show is of like, make sure that you try to rope in some language where it's like, hey, together we made a thing, right? 
uh, making explicit that connection between the two parties in that moment. So it serves both people. And then, yeah, okay, you've done that a couple of years. Maybe you want to do something a little bit more complex. Maybe you want to do a demonstration now. Maybe you want to do like a formal presentation with you demonstrate some key concepts of your art. Or maybe you want to do a hands-on workshop, right? Um, and those are for different people, right? The hands-on workshop is for people. It's like, the, for the audience, it's I love this stuff and I draw even when I'm not supposed to. I constantly get in trouble at school for drawing during math class. How do I formalize this into something that's a little bit more actionable than just a pure passion? Now there's an event. And, and it's not a class that you have to commit to for eight, nine weeks or a semester. It's a one-off. You walk in, you finish a thing, you go home with the satisfaction of you engage deeply with the thing for a manageable amount of time, right? So, mm. um, so one, one more example, and then yeah, I, I swear I'll, I'll be quiet. Uh, <laughs> Joe Fu, uh -oh. you, you, you met Joe Fu at A2CAF, mm -hmm. right? This mm -hmm. is somebody... Yeah, who, yeah. I look at him, I'm like, that that's a wizard right there. And what Joe does is he looks for those moments where there's an opportunity to create an event or an experience for people. So he had some kids at his table at A2CAP one year, and they were asking questions about, like, how do you draw this? How do you draw that? He's like, you know what? And he, he literally called me over. He's like, Jersey, can you come help me? And he threw a giant sheet of paper on the floor right in the middle of Artist, Artist Alley, right? It's like, so you're impeding traffic. But I was like, hey, I'm one of the organizers of the show. I get to make this call. And like, we all drew together on the floor. And Joe like did this like five minute little mini lesson for these kids where they were drawing alongside of us, all sitting on the floor like children drawing. And so it's like, is this something where you're just attentive to paying attention to the moment, pay attention to the need, and then offering something that is that was very service driven. That wasn't about him selling a book. That was about him saying like you're you're clearly very curious. Let's have a let's have a five minute class on it. Mm. It's it really is. A, there's a clearly you're 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 around to both bring out bring your products to the world, but also uh, engage in some kind of trade because that's make that makes it, that makes it sustainable. That's a system that we all work within, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's a, I think there's, there's, there, there's a helpful exchange between those different modes, being able to, to, you know, jump out of the, you know, getting out from behind your table means you're no longer optimized to do transactions anyway. Right. 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 Um, yeah. yeah. But you're saying that these other things are important too. So it's really uh, the putting enough work in to make what you care about a parent, I think is the service part. Right. Mm. And then that can take a lot of forms. It can be teaching artist stuff. It can be drawing on the floor in the right moment. Um, and it could be things that, that just putting in the work to describe what you make well. So then you can, you can, you can explore forms of advertising and pitching and all the, you know, kinds of things that you would want to do to get your product in the hands of the people that you're trying to get it into the hands of. Um, and I, I do think that there's a connection there with, you know, because you can you going from teaching artists to like uh, also write ads, write ad copy that is clear and compelling and whatnot. Uh, I see those as related because in both cases, you're you're have you have a capability, you have your product and the things that you of benefit that you're trying to get into others hands. Um, and then there's a lot more to talk about as far as the, but really beyond the, the scope of this episode is, well, um, well, how, what are, what are ways to advertise that, that make, that makes sense? It's like, we're, we're I, I'm drawing, I'm drawing parallels in that the, the getting ready to do that work is, um, is service minded and starting to get the message out. But yeah, that's, it's, but then what, right? Are you working on, you know, where do you put those messages? Well, there you go. There's ad campaigns for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. This, this is, uh, I, I'm, I'm learning a lot in my experience with CXC because I'm actually working with like a PR department and, and like when the show is over and I can like collect my thoughts in a way that is like where I'm not betraying any internal secrets, but like talking more about like a meta kind of idea, I'd love to get into that. Cause that I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm in that chaotic space right now where it's like, am I leveling up? Well, I'm confused all the time and I'm scared most of the time. I think that's leveling up. <laughs> and it won't be until I get to the side that I feel like, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I leveled up something. Um, another thing that I think about like in terms of like 
trying to make this more manageable um, in terms of like finding that aboutness of your thing and like what's valuable to you is getting some external feedback from like a brain trust as to, um, I don't know, like, can you tell me what my thing feels like to you? You know, um, so I had this experience recently with um, supporter of the show. And it feels like it's 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 okay to give her a shout out. Is uh, Becky Hilburn who has a Kickstarter going on for her Seven Inch Kara Volume Two right now, and she asked me to blurb it, and I was like, okay, well, you know, and so like I had to sit down and re- you know read the book and think about like, okay, what's the feeling this book gave me, and can I summarize that in a in a sentence? For her, and I think they actually they updated the video on the Kickstarter where you, you can actually hear me doing the read of my blurb, and it was something like, okay, you know, when I'm reading this, I'm thinking about just like warm summer nights, fireflies, you know, sitting with your family, and so I'm like, this is the book you read when this is happening, right? And, like, and then Carol, and Becca got back to me, she's like, that was great, that was like such a wonderful way to summarize the book. I'm like, well, it made me realize. I need to ask my friends to blurb my stuff, not so I could put the the blurb on the book, but to get that reaction, that 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 sort of um, succinct summary of how my work feels to them, and that will help inform how I then market my books. That is a fantastic uh, technique, honestly. So yeah, that's getting others' perspective helps you get unstuck uh, because. Uh, yeah, it, it can be really difficult. And especially if, if all sorts of things, when you look at your product, if what calls out to you are the things, the, the work and the techniques and the craft and the reasons you started to get into making that thing, which may fit as far as some clarified, concise version of that may be perfect to describe to your audience. But like one way to get out of your own head is to, yeah, that's get, get some, Get some ideas from uh, from from um, from those who are open to being part of your brain your brain trust. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, I had a, you know, back when I used to do Boulder and Fleet ads on the Lean Into Art Cast. I you you probably heard me. I'm speaking to the leaners now. Talk about this unlikely friendship. Fleet wants this out of the, out of the world. Boulder wants this out of the world. That did not come immediately in the development of the project when I was working on a pitch. And I was really focusing on Boulder's relationship with with violence. Like the, that was really the theme I was leaning hard on. Dan Mishkin looked at the pitch and he said to me, he's like, you know, you're not answering a question to me. He's like, why are these two very unlikely people good friends? Like, well, how, how does that friendship work? You know, I was like, oh, my gosh, you're right. Mm-hmm. And then I realized that is also the selling point of the project. It's, it's two people with very different worldviews with a common goal. OK, let's lean into that in the, into the marketing of the book. Mm-hmm. So. Um, what a, yeah, what a great way to get out of your own head. So, and to close out, it's worth it putting, putting in that, that work to be able to describe what you made in a way that connects with other people is really valuable. And you can show up in a variety of ways once, once you have that, um, which could be, you know, doing, doing other work, helping others, learn the things that you've learned. And, um, and even if, even if you look at it as the, that, oh, well, you know, not to oversell the teaching artist thing. If, if you think, well, why would I, I, have, I resist this. I'm not an authority. How could I, how could I be yeah. of value there? You could be there at the learning moments and I've, and, and, and appreciate that path as someone is, is at where they're at. And, you know, you don't have to be the most skilled person in the room to facilitate a good learning experience. <laughs> right. It, 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 took, it took me a long time to realize that, wait a second, the teachers I had growing up weren't experts in everything they taught me. <laughs> mm. Oh. Yeah, it does. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, I think that's a little bit of the pretend premise of uh-huh. like, you know, this title, therefore, you know, infall- infallible you know, amazing, you know, levels of skill. Right. But yeah. And then it just means that's why they're showing up. Yeah. Ah, oh, well, cool. I think, I think, uh, we walked around it a little bit I think we kind of, uh, I hope we addressed it in a, in a useful way. If anybody has any thoughts, questions, or wonderings afterwards, you can join us in the lean into Art discord, which we'll talk about shortly. And, uh, you know, comment, 
question. And like I said, I, I love the word wondering as is, 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 is woo-woo as it can sound because a wondering is not a question. A wondering is, I'm wondering about this because sometimes the idea of asking a question paralyzes us because it makes us say, like, I got to show up with a good question, a good question. And then somebody says, there's no such thing as a bad question or a stupid question. Well, maybe I'm not gonna I'm not gonna adjudicate that one. But what I will say is that like if, if the word question gives you pause because you're trying to think of something really clever and insightful and like really cutting to the bone of the whole thing, which is like there's a temptation there. Uh, okay, how about you just present a wondering? I wonder about this. Boom, you got the conversation started. So, I yeah, say, that's good. Yeah, you re- you uh, diminished the risk of feedback with that. So thanks for doing that. <laughs> Thank you for hanging a lampshade on it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, let's take one more break and then we'll like close with our two minute challenge or two minute. I keep saying challenge. It's a two minute practice. It's a practice. It's not a challenge. It's not. You don't have to like grunt and sweat when you do this. It's a practice. It's something you do for fun. It's something you do with a little bit of spare few minutes. Um, first, we got to thank some more people who make this show possible. What do you say, Rob? Um, that sounds excellent. <laughs> and I, Because I, I think those people happen to be us. They are us, and we make lots of things, and bring, we think hard about the things we make, and we bring those thoughts into this project called Lean Into Art, and the thing that I make that I hope you will check out is the 4 Million Years Later podcast, and it is, it, yes, it's another podcast, but it's very different from Lean Into Art in that it's a pop culture show. We're talking about a cartoon series from the 1980s called The Transformers, Generation 1. Me and my buddy Hoover watch an episode a week and then convene to talk about what we saw and like do a lot of like deep story analysis. I will... Say this, the latest episode at the time of this recording is episode 32, The Master Builders. Um, I disliked this episode as a child, as an adult. I found it so moving that you actually hear me break down a little bit at the end of the episode. Um, mm-hmm. I, get, I get very emotional about this. And what is it about? I think it is an, uh, an allegory for making a bad deal with a, um, a business partner to make art. And in in the conflicting desires to make art, and the the stories we tell ourselves to uh, to cross the line into making a bad deal with a with a, another organization in order to bring your art to life, and what the penalties are for that, and how the endeavor of making art is something where it's a dialogue between you and the world, and you don't always get to determine what. Uh, the world thinks is valuable about your art. And that's where that dialogue comes into play. And there, there's a moment at the end where I really hang on this moment where this character deals with this crushing disappointment, uh, but with still with a twinge of hope. And man, it's just hard for me to take. <laughs> so uh, episode 32, if you want to check it out, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. So Rob, you want to talk about the stuff that you make? I do. Um, yeah, so I've been working on uh, Guitar Fretter quite a bit. And uh, you can, you can, if, well, let's see, I'm going to go ahead and share my window. Oh. Um, yeah, so if that shows up correctly, yep. cool. We're looking at it. Well, here you go. This is Guitar Fretter. It's available on lots of platforms. Um, it's, it's for, uh, well, it's, for, it's on iOS and Android and uh, Windows and Mac um, desktop. Where uh, and, it, and it works great on tablets, but it also works well if you have mouse input and what have you. Um, and the idea is to memorize the note positions on a guitar fretboard, but make it make it fun and interesting. And um, and as you play, you'll find the, that there's patterns as far as the the spacing of the relationships of the notes across the different strings. And it's funny because um, this I've put a bunch of weeks into this version of Guitar Fretter. Uh, it's, it, this game's been around a while, but uh, I, I do keep tweaking and adding uh, features and whatnot. It's super funny because I'm working on the sequel to this, but this one is still really good at what it, what it does, which is to just make a little action game. Here we go. Um, of memorizing the note positions on the guitar fretboard. And it's it rewards you for the memorizing and that's the that's the core that's the core hook of it too and it was fun to return back to this even though i was working on its its sequel and it's just this tuning and tuning and and tweaking it so that it's uh it has um it just you know does does what it does more reliably right because older versions of guitar fretter it's um it, it, i i kind of had the outlook 
uh, like how if you play Pac-Man long enough, Pac-Man will crash. And if it's good for Pac-Man, it's good for Guitar Fretter. Um, and so if you got to like, you know, up, upwards and level 20, right, you keep playing, things go faster. There's more and more and more going on. And uh, uh, and it would crash. And I, I've i tuned it now where I don't think Guitar Fretter will, will crash. I, I don't know, you know, you will crash before Guitar Fretter. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> That's uh, and that at least that's that's the hope. So I mean, it deserved that amount of work and tuning before, but you know now it's happened, and there's lots of little adjustments and updates. In in, in also when you um, when you play, um, there's you can do four four or five string bass, six seven string guitar. Um, you can choose your difficulty level. You can do custom tuning. Um, and uh, when you when you start at a harder level, it's this is a lot harder now. So if you just make sort of three mistakes it right away without earning more life boom you're done <laughs> so hard is harder now for sure anyway lots and lots of tweaks and love and updates in this version of guitar fretter and um and it's out everywhere right now except ios i'm working through the app store process to get it there but i will do it in the coming days we'll see how it goes but uh but yeah go to on uh, guitarfretter.com Okay. What's that? Oh, no. Go ahead. Uh, you can go to guitarfretter.com. You can go to robstenzinger.com slash store.html, or you can go to the itch.io page for it, which is robstenzinger.itch.io. And uh, it'll, that'll show you Guitar Fretter right there. So check it out. And it's, it's, it's only two bucks. But um, I'm thinking of doing a reverse sale to, uh, to, to get some, uh, to generate more talk and and uh and funding what's a what's a reverse sale where i charge more for it for a little while oh (laughs) neat yeah interesting idea okay cool guitarfretter.com there you go Uh, and the last thing we hope you will check out today is the lean into our discord yes we have a discord server and uh it's a place for you to hang out with fellow leaners and talk about past episodes talk about suggest ideas for future episodes and also share some of the work that you do with the two-minute practice and with uh, other works in progress there's there's some brain trust stuff happening in there between the leaners where they're sharing some work in progress getting feedback from one another some really great to see thanks to everybody who has been hanging out in the discord server the invite link will be in the show notes for this episode and every episode all right ready to do some two-minute practice I am ready. All right. Two minute practice time. Hey, Jersey. Hey, Rob. So <laughs> what what uh, what were we practicing this week? Well, let's see. So looking back, um, that we we were saying that the this whole bibliomancy thing is kind of fun. And looking back through through things on your shelf could be comics, could be any kind of book, but flip through some pages. And do that thing where stop at a random spot and see what you notice, what what moves you, or or, or you know, is, is it really positive, really negative? Uh, what storytelling elements are affecting you, and uh, just take note of that, and and do that for two minutes at a time. You know, when so, you describe that that way, I realize that uh, uh-huh. my bias got got in the way of part of my practice because, like, I specifically was only looking for things that made me happy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there was there was a, nothing wrong with that yeah. I, I have to say like th- that's how it played out for me too so you're not alone i mean okay of course you know <laughs> it's, it's hunting for those like hidden treasure things right but but you're right like when you use the word moved i there were things that like i saw where i was like Meh, you know like moved in a negative way like yeah that's not that's not skillfully <laughs> done you know um but uh or that's boring but what I wound up capturing were, I did three practices and what I wound up capturing were things where I was like, Oh, this makes me happy whenever I look at it. So let's start with yours. What did you do for your practice? Okay. I'm going to switch to my desk camera. Oh, Linda Berry. That's a great place to go. Yeah. What a source. Um, Oh yeah. I, I have, um, just a whole big stack of, uh, um, things I took off my shelf. I mean, that was the, that was the process. I didn't make it through the stack. Um, I, I just, I grabbed a bunch of books that, well, I, I just, as soon as I saw them, I was like, Ooh, yeah, what's in here. And, and so of course this book, which I'm, I'm just only scratching the surface on 
in my read of it. It's, it's sort of on my pile. And, uh, but what I, and, and so I, I, I would go through something in my, you know, in the pile and then, well, um, do, uh, do this practice and, and, you know, see what came up, but then I put a little sticky note uh, on there. So with the Linda Berry book, I, I found uh, inviting complex landscapes of words, images, asking me to try to grow and create. And um, I, that just felt awesome. This is, you know, that's, that's, and that's, this book is, is, is full of, full of that. It's a very dense landscape. And um, that's, that stood out to me there. If I go into super detail, we're, we're going to do an hour long podcast. So <laughs> keep flying. Um, I have a, a stack of old, um, the uh, like instruction manuals and stuff for different uh, games. Uh-huh. Back in the day, people would design and print and pack in for free instructions and stuff, right? Yeah. For, for video games or sometimes even bonus comics. And so those are by the, Jose Garcia Lopez, Atari Force. Oh my gosh, those books are so good. Yeah, and this isn't in perfect condition and stuff, but it's... Uh, so I was... Um, uh, and, and so sometimes I would, I would think of, of like what caught my eye at the time and also what catches my eye now. And, and it just, I would just quickly do this. I mean, I didn't have time to like sit there and, and hi, get into deep context and clarifying. I just went like, Oh, um, I really, you know, it stood out to me. A lot of, a lot of media and stuff that I consumed wasn't very diverse. And so I thought, I know I thought it was awesome that the Atari force had some, some diversity. Um, that's cool. But then there was uh, books that like, this is a, what's funny, this is a reprint that a friend got, um, and basically had too many copies of, of so that they gave me their, uh, their copy of the Akari Warriors thing. And I'm like, <laughs> gosh, I really did consume a lot of stuff. The um, like art that was inviting powerful feelings on being a powerful creature, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, because of course, Akari Warriors, oh, buff dudes, look at that. <laughs> uh, buff dudes with guns. Um, uh, but then stuff like Reality is Broken. I've referred to this book a ton over the course of this podcast. It's been around a while. And it re- was, um, I've recently got a physical copy. I've always had a digital one. But um, one thing that I love about Reality is Broken is just thoughtful questions that clarify intentionality for a complex idea. And um you know, like, like thinking about like, how does a game work? And that's actually a pretty, you know, like what are pretty deep question. And what do I, does I write that page 21? So that's in the prose books. I tried to write down the page number that, that got me um, where, where I just flipped to it and what I was reacting to page 21. Yeah. What exactly is a game? Hmm. So, yeah. And I could go on, but I, you know, so I did, let's see, Norse mythology. I did. Oh, that's a great book. book. Book three. Um, and so I, and it was neat. I, I, as I went along doing this practice, it's almost like I got hungry from, it was like, I was powering up on all the different things that, uh, that, that get me really, you know, excited or that I would love to infuse my work with or practice because of, or something. Right. So anyway, there's, um, yeah, more examples to, to go, but, um, I, oh I yeah, one weird one. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, no, one weird what? One weird one I found is that um, is how it, uh, the in the instruction manual manual for Zelda: Ocarina of Time, um, uh, I wrote a um, a sticky note and and I was like, gosh, I like sticky notes for a long time, I guess, because <laughs> um, you know it's one of those things where the books themselves can become repositories of my your own experience, right? Um, and I thought that uh it's it's like finding a a, a treasure inside of a treasure yeah so, anyway but yeah that, uh, that sticky note was was like it was like some kind of button combo for something oh yeah specifically what it was is um it's it's for playing the the um one of the two couple different tunes on the ocarina uh, which let you do different things uh or or is it yeah ba- bonnaroo i don't remember i i don't remember enough to but it was so the the um the game the game the controller for the um uh for the N- nintendo 64 was that 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 quirky um spaceship looking thing yeah you had those handles and like one of the one of the inputs was uh this d- sort of direction 
pad that wasn't they were like they were like little yellow buttons that were like north south east and west yeah exactly and that's how you'd operate the ocarina so i could i recognize like what i meant there but yeah i couldn't tell you what song and stuff that was (laughs) that's great yeah those old video game manuals i wish i still had my metroid one um those were some like the the weird the weird art in them and then also the fact that yeah it like it sort of gave you um a sense of what the story was in the thing that you were playing so that too yeah video game manuals are are quite a uh, quite an artifact and uh and i just i was doing that thing where i was just quickly trying to not spend much time preparing for and so i was just getting a stack of things off my shelf and i saw a video game manuals i'm like yeah okay and uh and yeah, anyway, that was, it was neat. Uh, and uh, because I, I keep them because of, yeah, attachment to the game, but like the manual itself, which I know I didn't think that highly of at the time. And I always felt a little annoyed where it's like, what, how do you do this thing? Yeah. Flip, flip, flip. Yeah. And, but once in a while it's, you get this really energetic extra art and interpretation on the the characters. If it's not like exactly representational, um, that that's like, Oh wait, that's cute. Or this is exciting. And well, and, and bonus. It, especially going back to like older games, like the NES eight bit system, um, you didn't know what the creatures were even called in these games. You had to use the manual to find out like what the different villains in Mario two were called like, Oh, I'm fighting Birdo. Mm-hmm. I only know that because I read the manual about Birdo, you know? <laughs> um, anyway, another thing like, okay, so this week's leading to art episode was about like service driven marketing. And part of the discussion we had was about how do you name the things that are meaningful about your work uh, in a service-minded way? I feel like this practice has a very practical element to it in that you're sort of like, in a very informal way, charting your tastes and seeing what you refer, what you respond to. And then I'm sure you could take those observations back into the work that you do and see how it's being expressed. Um, and, and in my case, so for my practice this week, I, like I said, I did three. Um, well, let me switch to, instead of that, uh, I'm switching to all sorts of things instead of my overhead cam, which isn't working anymore. <laughs> this has been a fun day for, <laughs> for snafus. Um, I'll just hold it up to the camera like in the old days. Um, so I pulled, this is a really nice opportunity for me to visit some of my long boxes. I have several long boxes of floppy comics that I never dig into. And I, one of the ones I pulled out, and the moment I saw the cover, I was like, oh, I remember this issue. I remember reading this as a kid, and I really loved it. Like, kid, I was like 14. Um, Spider-Man, uh, Spectacular Spider-Man issue 99. There's even an ink stain on it from what it sat on my art desk when I was in high school, and I was inking with a crow quill, or trying to. <laughs> um, like, this just sat there, just because I just, I just loved this issue so much. And so, I, I, of course, I flipped through. And what I landed on was this moment at the end of the story where... If we look at, let me see if I can get it centered in the shot. The, the panel that's centered in the shot where Spider-Man is like rubbing his head and he's like, oh my gosh, what a day. And then the spot who can like leap out of these black spots that hover in the air, kind of like a Looney Tunes character, pops out and says, one more thing. And then Spider-Man's like, oh boy. And I felt like this is such a good example of how in comics you can have moments that are beginning, middle, and end all at the same time. Like if you take away the dialogue, you see the spot raising his finger going like, basically saying like I'm, I'm asking for your attention and we see spider-man's hand is on his head like going like oh, oh my gosh but if you read the dialogue at the top he's like oh great you know what a day so that could have been when he was rubbing his head then the spot pops out and then we get the oh boy line right or not you know you could also read it as he didn't put his hand on his head until the spot came out but either way there's a before in the fact of him saying oh great what a day a middle, the spot comes on and says one more thing, and an end in that Spider-Man response, oh boy. And I feel like this is one of those things that I get super jazzed about as for, about comics as a medium, things that you can do, and it's it's a very quiet way to do it. It's not drawing attention to itself. It's just a funny little moment in the story. Um, and it's a way for me to be mindful of that Like when I'm teaching. like This is something I could bring. You could do a whole 15-minute lesson on this right, and play with it, write out some scenes together, and, you know, uh, figure out how you could do a moment that does before, middle, and after. My second entry is this issue of ALF, ALF number 22 from Marvel Comics. <laughs> and 
this is just the nice moment where on the page we have this scene where Alf is talking with this Professor X analog and then they come up with the X Melman, you know, which is all funny. But I, I what caught my eye was this third panel here, which was all a silhouette, right? And it was a moment where I reminded myself that, hey, guess what? Sometimes less is more. And sometimes visual interest is a tool of storytelling. You can break up the flow of visual information just by making something all in silhouette. Is it trying to like convey mood or tone? No, it's just trying to be more visually interesting in a, in a sea of characters. And that itself is a storytelling tool. So reminding myself that I can take shortcuts, not only to make the art easier for me, but also to make it more visually interesting. Um, so it was nice to get back in touch that with that. That is really cool. Wow. And my last one... Uh, oh, go okay. ahead, Rob. No, I just... It's it's interesting the kind of uh, ex experience, the inventory of things that you're you're gathering. And um, yeah, I... I Anyway, I'm I'm liking this practice. This is almost like a this is a thing to carry into like maybe a certain stage of, a, you know, d developing a project. This is a thing to do. Yeah. So go ahead. But what's your what's your third one? My third one is Justice League America issue sixty, the last of the Keith Giffen J.M. DeMattis run on the series. So they brought back uh, artist um, Kevin McGuire. Uh, I don't know if you ever read this, Rob, but it's basically the the whole premise is it's the Justice League as, if it were a sitcom. So like you could see like Blue Beetle over here is like out of shape. And, you know, we don't see Batman or Superman anywhere. It's all like second stringer characters. And a lot of the stories <laughs> revolved around like downtime stuff. Uh, but this is the last issue of that series where like the team's breaking up. And so it's got like a, kind of a somber feel. But I got stuck on this page where these two characters are talking in a park. And in that third panel, we see that the color switches to just blues and purples. And then even oh, yeah. at the end... They're all just blue and then like that, like purplish color in the background. And huh. it, it, again, it's this is something that old comics, like these print, printed comics, did a lot back in the yeah. 60s, 70s, 80s, and even into the early 90s um, as a way to create mood, but also to create visual interest. And it, it's simple. It's, it's simple and it's expressive, right? And I feel like I don't give myself the... Um, the luxury of doing this sometimes. And I love how it can be used to create a sense of depth too, very, very clearly and simply. Right. Like you, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, um, you're doing a lot of illustrations in a typical comic and like each, each one is a chance to, um, if, if you make the, all the panels conform then you, maybe you're losing a chance to express something. Mm -hmm. And uh, then yeah, having that, yeah, that's interesting. The, the dropping, dropping in and out of, of a larger color palette. Mm. That's pretty cool. It used to be way more common. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Used to be. And it, it's something where I, I just felt like, okay, that's something to grab onto future projects. Is that something I can like incorporate to help make things more manageable, more efficient, and more visually interesting all at the same time. Because there, there, are, there are different people to serve in a project. There's me, the creator, and there's the audience, and we both need to be served by this thing. It's not just a one-way transmission, right? So mm -hmm. anyway, um, so wow. yeah, I, I feel like this is a good one, and I feel like it was one that we should like pull back and do again. We should do a repeat of this uh, down the road, see what we come up with. Oh, that's cool. I'd be, I'd be for that. And, and I imagine there's ways to constrain it to, to dial in, uh, different kinds of, well, I, so if you're trying to gather like a really strong, mm, like a mine of inspiration, I mean, it's a bit like the, uh, like a mood board effort, but you could theme it based on different things. That is uh, I mean, it's a great spin up activity for, um, for doing work on a project. Oh gosh, yeah, you're right. Like when I could do physical classes again, that's gonna be something I do. I'm gonna dump a big pile of comics in the middle of the room. And say, everybody grab three, you know, <laughs> and you have to you have like two minutes to find something interesting in each of them, and you got to be ready to talk about it. That's an awesome warm up exercise. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, All right. That's that's super cool. So I, you know, we'll revisit this one. I assume we're not going to revisit it immediately, though. No. So what what do you want to do next week or this this week for the two minute practice? Hmm. 
Well, let's see. We've we've been uh, we've been doing a variety of things. This was you know this was more of a, a, a seeking and taking notes. It's almost like an annotating type of exercise to create an inventory. So, what would be another activity? Hmm. Composition or. I don't, I'm just letting words come out of my mouth. I honestly have no idea. Well, we what, did a composition one not long ago where we were doing like a squint yeah. test at art. Um, hmm. I feel like it, it, the time has come for us to do a sound one again, like making making noise. <sighs> oh, yeah, that's true. It's been a while. Like, what kind of noise do you want to make? Do you want to uh, pick up an instrument kind of thing and see what happens? Well, I'm or... yeah, I'm I'm moved into my new home, so I can actually get access to my. I have a couple different instruments I could potentially Ooh. play. So two so minutes of just what making... would be a good constraint to have when you pick up an instrument? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Besides the two minute constraint of just making noise for uh-huh. two minutes. Um, yeah. I don't know. Like just try your best to try to capture like a 15 seconds of a piece of music that you like. Oh, okay. So see what comes. So uh, in the two minutes of, exploration with uh, with the sound uh see if there's uh look for a a, a strong 15 seconds yeah well i exactly. think about i think or... about like the, the the old joke from the wayne's world movie where it's like the he picks up the guitar and he immediately starts playing stairway to heaven They're like no and they point to the sign nobody plays stairway to heaven but it's like <laughs> having been around musicians when i was growing up it's like they all had like i remember like metallica's one it was a, that that doom, 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 doom thing and i remember oh, like yeah. one of my buddies like he cracked it he figured out the notes he's like look at look at what i can do and he's like doom, 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 doom. i'm like yeah and you're like maybe that's enough <laughs> That was a victory, and I didn't notice it at the time, you know? So maybe this is something where we just wanted to capture a few notes of a, of a piece that we like and just play it for, 50, for two minutes. Okay, cool. So and it, so it's about um, uh, rea- this is a you playing on your, your instrument based on some other song you've heard, mm-hmm. right? Oh, yep. okay, cool. What do you think? That's, yeah, it sounds, sounds like a lot of fun. Okay. Sounds like... And that means yeah. I'm going to have to like bring one of my instruments down to the studio for next week's recording so we could demonstrate it. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's see how that goes. All right. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Jersey. And here we are again at the end of a Lean Into Art cast. Thanks, everybody, for downloading, listening, and watching. We record the show Weekly, on, usually on Thursdays, we stream it live in the Lean Into Art Discord, and then we click it as a podcast at pat- patreon.com slash lean into art and lean into art.com. We'll be back next week with another episode. Till then, I have been Jersey Drozd of lean into art.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of lean into art.com, and I'm Rob Stenzinger all kinds of places like Instagram. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user leanintoart, and you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening.